Okay, in this exciting installment of Davidson Academy Physics, we are going to look at the dispersion of light and what is called single slit diffraction. And since we're doing all this light stuff, I thought I would try out a new little tool of a laser pointer. Yeah, look at that. Have your cat chase it across the screen. Okay, moving on. You guys hopefully are aware of this, what's called the electromagnetic spectrum, but essentially this is showing us different colors of light correspond to different wavelengths of light. We're not going to get into this in too much detail. Uh, outside the visible spectrum you have what's called UV and there's other stuff beyond here and on this end you have infrared and other stuff beyond there. Okay, now the reason I'm pointing this out is because this plays a part in what's called dispersion. So normally we don't see all these different colors if we have white light even though it's composed of it because they're all kind of intermingled together and all of them mix to give us white light. But it turns out that I lied when I said there's only one index of refraction. There's actually uh, several indices of refraction or refractive indices. Um, for a given substance that that index of refraction actually changes a little bit depending on the color or the wavelength of light that you have. For some substances the change is gradual, for other substances the change is more dramatic. But what that does is it allows us to do things like prisms. So you guys have probably seen these before as well. You pass light through a prism and you end up getting a pretty rainbow. And the reason why that happens isn't because of some special geometry of the prism. I mean, that helps too. But if it weren't for the fact that the index of refraction is slightly different for each wavelength, then this could never happen regardless of your geometry. So here, as we start with all white light, nice bundled together all the colors, it refracts once into the prism and starts to spread out a bit because the angles are all slightly different depending on the slightly different indices of refraction and then when it refracts again leaving this medium and out back into the air then it refracts more and so that's why we can get the light spreading out like that and this phenomenon is called dispersion and this is exactly how rainbows are formed uh, in that case, you have a bunch of water droplets suspending in the air, suspended in the air. And when sunlight hits those water droplets, that's white light. And you get a couple of uh, refractions. One, when it enters, you get a reflection off the back and then another refraction as it leaves the water droplet. And so that's why the light spreads out and you see all the colors of the rainbow. And that's why they're always in a certain order. It's because that's the order of their refractive indices. Also, you pretty much only see a rainbow when the sun is behind you so that the sunlight is reflecting off of these and coming back at you. If you were over here, better grab my pen, I guess. If you were standing over here, here's your eyeball thingy. Uh, then some light would refract and then <clears throat> would might refract a little through here, but you're not going to have as drastic as an effect if the light didn't get to travel as far. Uh, and bounce back out the other side. Okay, so this, I don't know that we'll really have calculations with this. I think uh, in your calculus class they had you do a bit with this, but just be aware of that phenomenon. Okay, moving on to diffraction patterns. Uh, we're going to look at single slit diffraction, but where single slit diffraction was kind of first introduced, there's kind of a good story here. Um, Scientists were still arguing over whether light was a, was a wave or a particle. And this guy named Augustin Fresnel, a good French scientist, he went and presented to the French Academy uh, his theory that light was actually a wave. And he said, hey guys, look, it's a wave and whatnot. And um, one of the members of the Academy, his name was Simeon Poisson. Poisson means fish in French. Uh, he thought that uh, Fresnel was crazy and he actually had this idea and he said, well, if light diffracted, if it was diffracting because it's a wave, then if you have a solid object, light will bend around and these two uh, waves of light on either side will be in phase when they hit a screen and so in the center of a shadow you should get a nice bright spot. And he said, obviously this isn't what we see 
Uh, but it turns out you need to have light that is of the same color, the same wavelength, and you need it to be in phase so that you've got your crests here when it goes past the object, so that it's still in phase here. And another guy went and did the experiment named François Arago, and uh, he saw a nice bright spot in the middle. And after that, it wasn't named after Fresnel, who... Uh, first presented the wave theory to the French Academy. It was named after the skeptic uh, Poisson. So this is known as the Poisson spot. And uh, we're not going to do much calculations with this, but this idea of light uh, diffracting allows us to have another phenomenon known as single slit diffraction. And so essentially you have this opening here, and as it diffracts you get different uh, circular waves coming out of that and those will interfere with each other just like we saw with double slit diffraction and so you're going to get this interference pattern where you have light spots in certain locations and dark spots in another what this is showing behind here is the relative intensity so the central bright spot as we call it is the most intense uh, by far and it's because most of the light goes there but you also get these dark fringes on the outside here and let me show you a couple of animations of that. So, actually, I want to start with this one. Uh, this is at a website called Walter Fent. I'll try to remember to put links to these. And here we have a sl single slit, a uh, light of the same color incident on this slit here. And what this is showing, it's not that the light goes out and rays like this, but this is the angles that you have to your bright locations. And the width of your slit is going to make a difference to exactly how diffracted that gets and the wavelength or the color of light also affects your pattern. Now in this case you've got a curved screen so it's really uh, just showing the angles and it's going to keep the spacing equidistant on the screen but you could project this onto a flat screen in which case the spacing would change but we have the same idea here changing wavelength is going to affect our pattern as well as changing the width of our slit will affect the pattern. And here, since we've got a f flat screen, the distance is going to affect it as well. Right? And then here is what I was talking about earlier. So this is showing the intensity of these different spots. I'm not sure what all these circles popping up are. Yeah, you can play with it and see. A little weird. Anyway, uh, here's your pattern. Here's the relative intensities. Let's jump back to PowerPoint. All right, so to explain how this happens, we use a similar explanation to what we did with, um, with double slit diffraction, only now we just have a bunch of rays of light coming through a nice wide single slit. Well, it's not very wide, it's actually very thin. And if we think about the light that goes straight through, that's all going to uh, interfere constructively, and so that's why you get the bright spot in the middle. But as far as the dark locations, here's what happens. If you have light that's coming in at an angle, and if we imagine a light source you know, way off to the left here, then you're going to have light coming in at all kinds of angles. So you'll get all of these angles of light coming in, and so you'll get the different parts of the pattern. For the dark locations, what you want is to have that beam of light. Uh, let me grab my laser pointer here again. Uh, the beam of light at the top is going to be exactly off by one wavelength from the beam of light at the bottom. And you might think, well, if it's a multiple of a wavelength, then they're going to be in phase again. But what happens is, if that one's off by a wavelength, there's a wave right in the middle that's off by half a wavelength. So this bottom ray cancels with the middle ray because it's a half a wavelength off, so you get destructive interference, crests meeting troughs. The next one up is going to be off by half a wavelength from that one, that one's going to be off by half a wavelength from that one, and so forth. So there will be matching pairs, all of them off by half a wavelength, and so this is where we get our dark locations, is when the top and bottom differ by a wavelength. Okay, and then if we keep going here, if we're off by three halves of a wavelength, then there's a point here where things are off from the bottom ray by a wavelength and here by half a wavelength. So this one is going to cancel with that one, this one's going to cancel with that, and so all these waves in the bottom two-thirds here, grab my pen again, so all these waves right in here in the bottom two-thirds are going to cancel out, but in this top third up here, these guys are not going to have anything to cancel out, so that's where you get another bright spot. 
Here, if you're off by two uh, wavelengths, then these guys cancel with those guys, and these guys cancel with those guys, and you get a dark spot again. So we can use the similar reasoning that we did with the double slits to get our equations for this, and it works out like this. So this here is the difference in the path lengths between the top and the bottom of the, the, the rays of light at the top and the bottom of the slit. So if that difference is a multiple of a wavelength, then you get the wave in the middle that cancels with the bottom and then all the others will have corresponding pairs. And so this is where you get a minimum, a dark spot. And then <clears throat> if you're off by a half a multiple of the wavelength, then that's when you're going to get your bright spot. Now, if you remember in that pattern, uh, let me see if I can pull that up again real quick. Uh, this guy here, this confusing one. Uh, these are so spread out, you don't get nice sharp peaks nearly as much as you do in double slit diffraction. So they don't really say that we know the exact location of that bright peak because it's so spread out. So that's the whole reason behind having this uh, approximately equal to. And in, you'll see when we do the examples, most of the time we find the width of that middle slit here by looking at the distance to the two dark locations because those are defined more sharply. And then we can say, well, I know how wide this guy is because I know where the dark locations are on either side. Okay, see you next time.